Well, good morning, First Baptist Church, and for all of those joining us on Facebook and social media and the radio, we just want to uh, welcome you in this morning, and uh, what a great day it is to worship our Lord and to give Him praise this morning. So I want to invite all of you where you're at to stand, and let's sing this morning of His amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in all and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who brings our chaos back into order? And who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, and who rules the nations with truth and justice, shine like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I have been set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave and Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy This is amazing grace and This is unfailing love that you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I have been set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place 
that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I have been set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. That's why we sing this morning. Amen, church. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, that is why we sing for all you've done for us. And Lord, even during these times where it's been trying with COVID, with the protests going on in our nation, with, as you said in Scripture, brother turning against brother, Lord, uh, we know that you are sovereign and you are on the throne, and Lord, none of this surprises you, for you told us it would happen. But the other thing that you told us that you would never do is never leave us or forsake us, Lord, and we thank you that you are with us, and that you're in our midst this morning. And Lord, we want to formally invite you to be with us this morning. Lord, we know that where two or more gathered, you are there, but we, we want to invite you, Lord. We want you to be here with us. Lord, be with our pastor this morning as he comes to share the message that you've laid upon his heart. Lord, we know that it's a, a message that we all need to hear, so help us to be Challenge, Lord, help us to be encouraged as we hear from your word. Lord, as we continue our praise this morning, may your name be lifted up. And Lord, we pray that worship would would happen. We know it's not something that that just happens out of the blue. It's something that we need to participate in, that we need to be a part of. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. And would you remain standing as we're going to crown him with many crowns.
By faith, by faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove His faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth, with the power of His promise in their hearts, of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. And we will stand as children of promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw when the long for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and triumphant from the By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth We will stand we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. This mountain shall be moved And the power of the gospel shall prevail For we know in Christ all things are possible For all who call upon His name And we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We walk by faith and not by sight, and we will stand as children of promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul. Reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would hold a rebel to your will, and if you had me first, I would refuse to stand. But as 
as I ran, my help and peace, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross, and I beheld God's love display. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. And alleluia. All I have is Christ. Alleluia. So all I see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only boast. be seated this morning. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. And we are glad you're here, not only in this building, but also if you're watching by social media. We're glad that you have joined us. We trust that you have your Bibles with you and invite you to join us in Luke, the 15th chapter. And the subject that I'll be preaching on today, the Lord is looking for those who leave. And so you'll be turning or scrolling in your phone on your app that has a Bible app, and you'll go down to the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. As you are turning in your scriptures, um, often around our city, uh, you and I can see a photograph in black and white. Shows a young girl, shoulder length, Blonde, black, or brown hair, parted down the center, maybe pulled back behind her ears. Her eyes set low beneath the high forehead, her light or dark color eyes and widely spaced. Her smile reveals metal braces across her upper teeth. This is a very pretty child, you think. But it's my child. The world can see the words beneath the photograph, missing person. In the FBI's National Information Center, NCIC, missing person file, there is 887,438 active missing person records. 
of which are juveniles under the age of 18. I count for 30,618 or 35% of missing persons. That is as of December 31st, 19. That's what is it reported. And many of these adolescents are runaways. Just for a little bit of uh, statistics this morning, COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. is at 136,000. What a sad thing to know that we have lost those people. Abortion deaths in the United States, 2011 was a million fifty-eight thousand. Last statistic that we have, 2017, there has been 862,000 deaths. 19 is not available for us because they blame it on the COVID. But in the world, there are 42.4 million, according to Christian Post. City of New York, which leads the nation, has 32,019 deaths as of yesterday. The New York abortions number 105,380. We have a tragedy, tragedy in modern society. Seems symbolic that even more tragic in our spiritual life. Many children of God have run away from home. They have turned away from the Father, away from the warmth of His presence, away from the comforting relief of His grace. There is a sadness in life away from God, but there's also hope. There's good news. Even there, God wants these runaways to come back. He searches for them. He begs them. Be, actually, pleads with them, beckons them to welcome them back and return and to find the protect, protection of His everlasting arms. If you are living away from God, no matter how far you have wandered, no matter how long it is you've been gone, you can come back to God today. I pray that and trust that you'll find encouragement that you need to turn back to the Lord Jesus. You'll realize that the first question in the Bible is found in Genesis, the third chapter and verse 9, where it says, But the Lord called man, where are you? first question in the New Testament is in Matthew, the second chapter, verse 2. Where has the one been born king of the Jews? If you are a runaway from the Father, you can come home uh, to Him. To begin, you just need to stop running and turn around and come back to God. If you're in this room, we'd ask that you stand in honor of God's Word, looking at uh, Luke, the 15th chapter. Beginning in verse 3, you may want to follow along in your Bible app on your phone or the Bible that you have brought with you, but you follow along as I read, beginning in verse 3. Now, Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And then she finds it. She calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Please join with me as we pray. God, today we have assembled in this place of worship. There are those who are worshiping you maybe in their workplaces, maybe in their great rooms or their homes. And we'd ask that you would open our physical ears as well as our spiritual ears to hear the message of your word. May we apply it to our daily lives and understand that each one of us 
has an amazing value and a purpose in our lives. To serve you, to honor you, and to know you. For it is in the precious name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Thank you for standing in honor God's word. Several years ago, a story was written titled, Please Find My Son. The event goes like this. A mother of three left her two children playing in the carport with his eight-year-old sister, five-year-old brother. Her husband was coming in late that night from work. Every 10 minutes, she checked on her children. She set a timer, and the timer she had set, it went off. She checked on her children. The baby boy was gone. Six and a half acres of lawn and woods surrounded her Bedford, Virginia home. The mother's first concern was the four-lane highway near her home, and she raced there and did not find her boy. Trying to trifle tears from kidnapping, she called the state police, then called the Bedford County Sheriff's Department. Imagine that. We call these people when we need help and want to defund them. Within 30 minutes, patrol cars, rescue trucks, and 100 people gathered on her lawn to help with a search. At 9 o'clock that night, a helicopter and a pair of bloodhounds had both proved ineffective. Her husband joined the search of, with hundreds, walking hand in hand, these volunteers trying to find this boy, but the fruitless search. But now it was near midnight, and the temperature was dropping, and the young boy had only shorts and a T-shirt on. The only one possibility remained. A thin, gray-haired woman was summoned with an air-sending German shepherd. And at 4.30 a.m., the dog picked up the scent and ran up the mountainside, barking wildly. Rescuers reached the dog. It was licking the little boy whose bleeding feet were caught in the briars. At the bottom of the mountain, the sea of people cheered with joy The little boy lost was found. And there is joy in finding who is lost. Jesus explained such joy finding the lost in the distinctive characteristics of God himself. Here in Luke, the 15th chapter, written by a physician named Luke who became a follower of Christ, Jesus gave all the ages this description of his father. More than anything else, God wants to find those who are lost. What else is God like? Jesus tells us in this 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, he is like the shepherd who will leave the flock of a hundred sheep and find the lost. He's like a woman who turns her house upside down down to find a lost coin, a father who hopefully is waiting for the return of a son who has left. God seeks those who are lost, and he longs, simply longs for our return. The greatest chapter of Jesus' parable begins with this statement, Now the tax collector senders were all gathered around to hear him. The mark of Jesus' ministry was the attractiveness of those who were horrid, but the repulsive, who were despised, even branded by his age. They were presented two different groups. They were known as the tax collectors and the sinners. The tax collectors referred to most despised the Jews of them all. The Roman Empire did not collect taxes for its own, sold the franchises for tax collectors. And the Jews who bought the franchise were considered by their fellow Jews as traitors to God and country, both both blasphemous and unpatriotic. Sinners referred not just to those who committed sins, but also certain occupations of people. They were shepherds, tanners, and butchers, 
may I add fishermen, the people who could not keep the Pharisees' legalistic interpretations of the Ten Commandments. And remember, the Pharisees had subdivided the Ten Commandments into 613 man-made rules. Most of the people could not read them or even remember them, much less keep them. You may have grown up learning something about tax collectors and who they were in the New Testament. What you may not understand, though, is the shock wave and the, the, the shock value of these who were known as tra tax collectors and the characteristics that carried during Jesus' day. Let's make it clear. Maybe in our generation, our church began to attract only the people who were on parole from the state penitentiary or those who were out on bond from the county jail. Along with him, suppose your church attracted the more affluent con man, exhortionist, and ripoff artist in your area, plus the slum landlords, and may I also add the massage parlor hostesses. Now, at the same time, the religious establishment openly rejected your church and condemned it. The scribes and the Pharisees were basically repelled by Jesus. The scribes were interpreters of the law, professional religionists of the day. The Pharisees were the layman's league, never more than 6,000 men. They were guardians of personal piety and purity. And when they saw the kind of crowd that uh, Jesus attracted, the Scripture says they murmured. If you look at the early part of chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel, you will find as we read in this couple of passages, uh, now the tax collectors and the sinners were gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law murmured. You know, they murmured. The word itself suggests a quiet complaint continually, habitually whispered to one another over and over again. They could not imagine that he would sit down and he eats with them. Somebody somewhere said that Tennessee Williams' family moved to the city during the famous playwright's childhood. He and his sister wanted to join the church choir because of their less than perfect social situation. They were made to feel like untouchables. He never went to church again. You may not know who Tennessee Williams is. He actually wrote Streetcar Named Desire, a cat on a hot tin roof. He was born in 1911 and went to church in 1969 only to an empty building to pray. I would wonder sometimes what would happen if people simply would turn again to church. Or if you allow Christ to come in your life and be the Lord of your life, what he could do with your life if you just simply yielded to his call to your life. Those of you following along realize that i also going to mention this morning the reality of lostness. Jesus did not denounce the detectors with anger. He reasoned with them from a common experience in stories. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The lost sheep. The lost sheep was lost through heedlessness or stupidity or unwary. Every Pharisee hearing the story knew that a Hebrew shepherd, though they were outcast in polite society, would search for a missing sheep. Jesus wants you to understand that God seeks people when they're lost from their own stupidity or heedlessness or carelessness. 
You know, the shepherd would leave the 99 and maybe he would search the pathways that they had traveled or maybe he would go off the trail and look for a sheep in a briar patch or maybe in the woods or a forest or maybe they just got lost and were fearful. You and I are fearful. Maybe we've been told uh, on and on and on again how seriously this virus is, this COVID-19 virus, and it is very serious, and we need to take heed to it, practice this physical distancing, washing our hands, watching and be careful of what we're doing. But we cannot destroy our life, cannot lose our homes, cannot lose our vehicles, cannot lose our jobs, and many have, as unemployment rates have constantly climbed trying to get our country back going again. We need to go to school. We need to be involved in the activities of the fall. And yet, we still make the rational decision. A teenager experienced with drugs for the first time and is hooked, destroyed his life. A married person flirts with passion and in a sudden gust of unexpected lust has swept into a situation never expected to experience. A dead-written employee takes money from the till, expecting to play back. Such people are heedless and stupid like sheep, but Jesus seeks them anyway. All through the Bible, the illustration that is oftentimes used for a shepherd refers to God, like the 23rd Psalm. You'll find here the Shepherd goes after the lost sheep and wants to bring it back into the flow, fold into the flock. You'll find that there is also the story in this parable of the lost coin. Beginning in verse 8, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my coin. You'll read in the same passage earlier in Luke 15 that the shepherd who went after the lost sheep found it, put it around his shoulders and returned back to the flock. But what did he say? He called his friends, his family, his neighbors. He wanted to rejoice over the fact that they had lost a sheep and had found it. You'll realize the reality of this coin. As you look at a $20 $20 gold piece. Women of the generation may have worn a circlet of 10 coins on their forehead. This would have been a woman's dowry, a sacred gift related to her marriage. And it was all she had of hers, of her own. It was her personal possession. The ornament of beauty was marred by the loss of one coin as well as her very personage. Could represent a day's wage. Some scholars think it may have represented a week's wage. How many of us had given a week's wage, maybe by a paycheck, and you lost it? Would you search diligently for it? Or if you lost the coins of a week's earning or a day's earnings, would you search for it? Or maybe even in our modern time, you get paid on the 1st or the 15th or the 20th or the 25th or the 30th, whatever day it is, and you immediately go online to see if your check had been deposited. And if it had not been, what steps would you take to make sure or find out why you had not received your pay? Maybe today I could tell you the story of the $20 gold piece among gentlemen in the American culture. The U.S. $20 gold piece always represented a standard, not the fact that people just wanted to carry around a $20 gold piece, is what it would purchase. From approximately 1880s, uh, this coin happened to be minted in 1875 that you're looking at. All through the late 80s, even in the early 90s, a $20 gold piece was the standard of purchase power. For example, among gentlemen, a $20 gold piece would buy a very high-end suit of clothes. It would purchase a 
shirt and tie. It would purchase shoes, socks, and a matching belt. It would be referred to as a unit. Today, a $20 gold piece is approximately worth $2,000. To be exact, $1,995. A $20 gold piece is .993 pure gold. $22,000 today will buy a gentleman a suit of clothes, a shirt, a tie, a pair of shoes, socks, matching belt. It is continued the standard of which we live by today. Before the pandemic, 42% of American people claimed to attend church every week. Now, that would mean they may attend a Bible study, someone's home. Children, students would attend some type of activity at the church. People would attend a worship service. I do know that more people have heard the gospel during this time in history than any time in the history of Christianity. Those who are using social media and all types of resources being used to proclaim the gospel message clearly and biblical truth. But I oftentimes wonder, what about the 50% plus who never go, who are living away from God? What of their children and those families who, through no fault of their own, never hear the name God or a word about God or the name Jesus Christ? are the values and commandments that are taught in even the Bible stories. You will notice if you're on social media, you'll, you'll find that we have a background of our vacation Bible school theme, which we will have a virtual reality. And if you don't have your children enrolled, you can enroll your children for our vacation Bible school because we believe in teaching the Bible at First Baptist Church. I believe in reading from it and explaining what it means. How about a spiritual life? We understand physical life. We understand emotional life. Many of us are struggling with physical distancing in our physical life. We are struggling with the emotional feeling of not being connected with other human beings. We understand that. But we are missing the spiritual dimension of our life. And that's why we are lost. God still seek them? Does the great shepherd's heart long for them? Jesus says, yes. Both parables of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin point out the value to God of the one. Whether it's one out of ten in the coins, can you imagine a heirloom circlet wrapping around a forehead or maybe carried on the body some way where it could be shown of ten coins, one of them is missing. Or one of a hundred sheep. Those who are in livestock realize how valuable a young lamb or a young calf is to the value of their well-being. God values the one. The contrast of our lives today, we lived in a suffocating, depersonification known by the names we have applied to the decades over the years. In the 40s, Franklin Roosevelt, FDR, spoke of a generation that had a rendezvous with destiny. In the 1950s, they were called the silent generation. In the 60s, it was known as the now generation. We want it now. Could be a parallel. In the 70s, it was the me generation. In the 80s, it is called the uncaring generation. They just don't care. And if there's any of that group who actually grew up in the 80s, finished high school in those years, started college, I want to awaken to you 
that it's no longer any time now not to care. You better start caring about the economic well-being of our nation and the world. You better start caring about the political system that you will live under and the children you're raising now will live under in your time. The 90s have been known as the grudge generation. Some have called it the gay 90s. Only the roaring 20s actually stuck over the period of time. Starting in 2000, it's called the alts generation or the naughty generation. The alt generation is that which an old word for zero. My grandparents' generation, they called it the alt 2 and alt 5 and alt 6 and 7. I was born in alt 2. That's what my grandfather would say. But instead of the alt generation, it's known as the naughty generation. Vance Packard called us a nation of strangers. Some have said loneliness is an American epidemic. We are oftentimes found in a sea of people, but there's only one who realizes there seems to be a lostness that they have missed now. In my generation, AT&T urged us to reach out and touch someone with a phone call. But life has changed. It has become so privatized. We do not know what other people are here for anymore. Television, computer, the bank teller machines, the cell phones, eliminate the need for others. There are 8 billion people now occupying this planet. But we serve a God who really cares for the one, the individual, the single, the solitary person. God has reached down from heaven, has sought us out. He seeks us in our loneliness and our lostness and desires to bring us back into the fold. You realize that God is searching for those who lead. I love to read this particular story out of Luke, the 15th chapter. It actually begins uh, when they have what is known as the lost son. You might want to follow along with me beginning in chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, I always like to preface that story by reading verse 20. By what, by, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, what all happened in this story that would cause such a, an amazing journey between a father and a son? Something like that would happen to many fathers and sons. They would be on non-speaking terms the rest of their life. As a pastor, I've known sons that didn't show up to their father's funeral. I've known fathers who did not even speak to their sons and left them no inheritance. But let's look what happens as we read through the story. Beginning in verse 13, not only... Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for this distant country. And as I read, there he squandered his wealth and while living. After he spent everything, there was severe famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went to the citizen of that country and who had sent him into his fields to feed pig pigs. To me, that's a play that Jesus is using on the minds of the Jewish people who despised pigs and thought them to unclean and wouldn't eat pork. You'll read verse 16. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, I like what it said in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now, the father had been waiting for him, knowing what would happen. I firmly believe without any reservation, a father would know that his son would soon be bankrupt. His son would run out of money. And so while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now verse 22 and following are an amazing thing that happens in this man's life. We would call him a son, maybe a boy, maybe a teenager, maybe a young person in his 20s. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And he is found. So they begin to celebrate. When I read through the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel, especially the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, at the end of one of every parable, Jesus was saying that they would rejoice and they would celebrate. And that's what we do. Even as believers, when a person repents of sin and comes to faith in Christ, all oftentimes they follow the first step of obedience by being baptized into the fellowship of believers and they become members not only of a church but become a member of the family of God. They begin to celebrate and they honor those who they are serving. In this particular passage, this son came to his senses and Maybe today you need to come to your senses. Let's talk about how you can come to God through Jesus Christ. See, there are those who are lost and not know it. There are really people all across our country and even our own city who drive by this church or maybe churches like it, and they don't even know why there's a church exists. They've never been in a church. They don't really have a plan on going to anybody's church. They don't even know why they should go to church. But yet they have missed the message. There are those who have taken a permanent vacation. We've been out of church. We've been told by the government we can't go. We can still go to Walmart. We can still go to Target. We can still go to what we call essential businesses. Be sure to wear your mask, but don't come to church. We're told not to go to restaurants. We're told and controlled. I firmly believe there's a dark niche there. We need to be careful of not lose what God has given us and the freedom that we have to proclaim clearly the hope that we have in Christ. See, we're separated from God because of our sin. Our sin is what separates from God. That's what causes us to be lost. We have no spiritual depth. We don't have no spiritual understanding. We're not grasped by the power of God in our life and His Spirit living within us, we don't know what's right or wrong. And so we have a generation that has grown up like that, not understanding the hope that we have in Christ is His forgiveness that He offered at Calvary's cross. The cross is the symbol of Christianity because the place where Jesus died to pay the sin debt we could not pay. And in that process, Jesus redeemed us, and allows us to have new life. He wants to come into our life and let the Spirit of God dwell in our life so we understand the Scriptures when we read it. We understand that there's a higher calling in life than just being controlled by the masses or the elite. We have been given an amazing gift living in this continental United States with the freedom that we have. And that freedom guarantees us that we have a right to be
become what God fully intended us to become. But we're crippling ourselves. We're destroying ourselves from within. We need to be discovered like a lost sheep, like a lost coin. We need to return like a lost son to the hope that we have in Christ. How do I do that, preacher? You simply bow with me in prayer. God, I have lost my way. I've never known the path you want me to travel. I ask that you become real to me today. Speak to my heart and mind. Allow me to understand your grace and your mercy. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and give me new life this day. Father, I've accepted you many years ago, but I've walked away from a church. I've not read the Bible in years. I've not listened to anybody proclaim its truth. I've not even downloaded a Bible on my phone app. prayed that prayer today, whether you're listening many miles from this place or in this room this morning, you simply acknowledge the fact that you're following Christ, you reject it. I've accepted Christ. You make a statement on our social media page. You contact us on our website. I want to thank uh, those of you who are joining us on Facebook and social media this morning. If you need any encouragement, any prayer, any help this week, if many of you made a decision for the Lord, we want to encourage you to reach out to us here at First Baptist Gallup. 
uh, by phone or by email or on our website. We want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. And uh, we just pray. We know that we are praying for all of you who have been listening and watching this week. Have a blessed week.